place where they told you what to chase told you how to run the race every move was on the page but i didn't like their way had to fight and misbehave had to find a way to change had to leave to find my way caught up in a daydream I the test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear two people discussing an extramural course. Fill in the information you hear on the application form below. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now, here is the conversation. Hi, Jenny. What are you doing down here? Oh, hello, Steve. Well, I'm trying to fill in this form, but I'm having a bit of a struggle as I sprained my wrist playing tennis yesterday. Don't worry. I'll do it for you. Let's have your pen. Right, fire away. Mm, let's see. I want to do the drama and theatre studies. I'd like to get the certificate. The course number is uh, 60201. No, sorry, 202. It seems to be on Thursday at 7.30. Yes, well, we don't have to put all that down. Now, I suppose we can call you Miss. Don't be funny. And spell my name right. Hmm. Well, if you'll have a name like Jenny McPherson... Let's see. It's M-A-C. No. Big M, small c, no A. Right. M-C-P-H-E-R-S-O-N. Yes, OK. And don't forget it's a capital P, Macpherson. Now, what's your address? Well, I've just moved, so it's 6 Westway Avenue, Longford. Hang on, don't go so fast. 6 Westway Avenue, where? Longford. What's next? Your phone number, daytime and evening. Well, I've only got one, as we can't have calls at school in the daytime, so put down the evening one. 605-4829. 4829, OK. And you're a teacher. How old are you? 29? Mmm, wish I were. No, Thirty-two. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Do they want my date of birth? No, don't seem to. Just age. Uh, how about educational qualifications? Well, I've got a degree in English literature and a diploma in media studies. Media studies, right. Now, have you ever done any of these extramural courses before? No, don't think so. Although I did do something on psychodrama once. But no, it wasn't extramural, was it? That seems to be it, except for the fee. Yes, well, that's the same for all the central courses. I think £25. I suppose I have to include it with this form. <laughs> Looks like it. Uh, do you want me to write the cheque out for you? But uh, you'll have to sign it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. 
Part 2. You will hear a student union officer explaining about the union's functions and services to a group of new university students. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello everyone. Now here you all are, new university students. And the first question you probably have is, what is a student union? Another question is, do I have to join? Well, regarding this second question, let me say that membership used to be compulsory in the past, but that did cause some controversy, particularly from students who wanted to remain free and unaffiliated, and this university responded. So, joining up is no longer compulsory. It's totally up to you, although I'll admit there is a fairly strong obligation to join since all students benefit from the large variety of services that we offer. We do understand, however, that many might be unwilling to join because of a supposed political slant to the union. Traditionally, student unions have been seen as being dominated by the left and I suppose that's still true to a large extent. Here, however, at this university, our union discourages such one-sided viewpoints and students across the whole political spectrum are welcome. Thus, if you feel that you are a conservative type, in other words, leaning to the right, you are particularly urged to join to provide a more balanced representation. Now, let me move back to the first question. What are we? We are a formal organisation, but totally independent of the educational body. We make our own rules, rent our own premises and organise ourselves as we wish. And our mission is basically to help you. For example, do you remember how you all arrived in late February to have an orientation week? That gave you an invaluable induction into life here, right? Well. The student union organised all the festivities at the end of that. The barbecues, partying and drinking and even the musical entertainment as well. We'll do that again on occasions and, as always, those events take place on the football ground. Now, do you have any questions before I move on? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, let me tell you more about the student union and its basic functions. In general, there are three, social, organisational and representational. Let's look at the first one. Basically, the union provides many social outlets for you to relax and have a better life at university. If you go to our union office, you'll find a list of the many clubs and societies we have, where you can make many friends with people who share a common interest. So, after class, sit with them in the cafeteria and discuss whatever takes your fancy. We also maintain sporting facilities and even our own gym, allowing you to relieve some of that pressure and worry after a particularly hard session in the classroom. And we have some small shops and other places where you can buy clothes and sporting gear, in other words, some retail outlets. And if you flash your student union card, you'll get up to 20% discount at the bookshop. But unfortunately, there are no discounts at the union cafeteria. Sorry, no cheap cappuccinos. Finally, 
There's a student union newspaper, and you're welcome to contribute or put in advertisements if you're buying and selling goods or textbooks. You can also place notices of a more personal nature on the notice board of the union office itself. All right, let's move on to our more serious functions, which are helping you get through life here, as well as representing you in times of trouble. Regarding the second issue, if you have a problem or a grievance, or if you feel under pressure or depressed for reasons both inside and outside the university, for example, perhaps a dispute with your landlord or the people in your local gym, then come to us. We have a range of counsellors and helpers, and even some lawyers, who you can meet in the conference room. So just sip a cup of tea or coffee with them and tell them your troubles, and they'll be all ears. Basically, there's every reason to join the student union, since whatever you need, whether it be social or representational, we will help you. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two university students talking about a music course. First, look at questions 21 to 23. As you listen, answer the questions. Josie, come in. How are you? I'm good. Can I get you a coffee or anything? No, that's okay. I can't stay long, but you said you wanted to talk to me about that course I'm doing this semester. Music 103? That's right. Actually, I was a bit confused because I thought you were majoring in maths. That's right. I am. I'm doing four maths modules this year. But it's an optional course. You just choose it if you're interested. And you can do it whatever department you're in. Why? Are you thinking about doing it? Well, I'm not sure. What are the requirements? What? The course requirements. I mean, what do I need to know about music to be accepted on it? I do listen to a lot of music, everything from hip-hop and rap to classical. And I can sing, sort of. Well, for a start, one special thing about this course is that it's distance learning. You don't actually have to be at the university to do it, and you don't have lectures. So you've got to be able to work on your own without someone telling you what to do all the time. Oh? Oh. No, that should be okay, I reckon. I'm more worried about the actual musical stuff, like... I don't know how to read music. That doesn't matter. They don't assume that. You'll learn as you go along. How's your maths? Not too bad. Right. Some of it's quite mathematical, so you really need to be strong there. But you play the violin, don't you? I don't play anything. You don't need to. What about computer skills? You're okay there? Yes, reasonably. Does that matter? Uh, yes, I'd say they're essential. Like I said, it's all distance learning, so it's computer-based. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 24 to 30.
Now listen to the second part of the discussion. What about lectures? You don't attend any. It's all online. So lots of the students aren't here in Canada at all. They're studying from home all over the world. We've got someone from my group in Jamaica and a couple from Taiwan. Oh, and some from Hong Kong as well. So how does it work? Oh, well, there's a multimedia course website on the internet where you can listen. You can listen and watch at the same time. And of course, you can do it at your own pace. So if you don't understand something, you just go back. Or if you want some more examples of the music, there are links there to things that you can listen to. There's quite a lot of theory, but it's all done through musical examples, so it's practical at the same time. Like in the last module I did, we looked at a bit of the music from the movie Star Wars, the Darth Vader theme, you know. Dum 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 dum. dum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Then we looked at a theme from Wagner's Tristan and Isolde. Do you know it? Written in the 1850s, and we could see there were all sorts of parallels between them. And that's a feature of the course. We often look at modern Hollywood themes to illustrate concepts in classical music. Hmm, it sounds really interesting. Do you have a course book? No, we don't use one. We're given a software program called Notability Light, and what it does is it presents what we write, the music we write, really clearly, and it also allows us to play back any piece of music on our computer at home. But that's not all. We can write our own music. Quite complex stuff for various instruments, and the program plays it back to us. Plays the actual music. Yes, so it means that your computer is actually your own musical instrument, and we can even submit our finished pieces to our tutor by email. So you do need your own computer, obviously. Yes, with at least sixty-four megabytes of RAM. That's okay. I've got a hundred and twenty-eight. Hmm. Oh, and a CD-ROM and a sound card, of course. No problem. So, how long is the course? It's six months. There are two a year, so you could actually enroll for the next one if you wanted. It starts in January. I started last September and I finish in February. And how many credits is it? Three. In order to pass, you've got to do six assignments. I'm just doing my fourth one now, and take a final examination. Oh, anyway, why don't you call round sometime and I'll show you the sort of things we do. You can even listen to some of my music. That would be great. Well, thanks, Josie. Now, are you sure you don't have time for that coffee? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk on two famous American presidents. As you listen, fill the missing information in the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. John F. Kennedy and Abraham Lincoln lived in different times and had very different family and educational backgrounds. Kennedy lived in the twentieth century, while Lincoln lived in the nineteenth century. Kennedy was born in nineteen seventeen, whereas Lincoln was born more than one hundred years earlier. In 1809, as for their family backgrounds, Kennedy came from a rich family, 
But Lincoln's family was not wealthy, because Kennedy came from a wealthy family. He was able to attend expensive private schools. He graduated from Harvard University. Lincoln, on the other hand, had only one year of formal schooling. In spite of his lack of normal schooling, he became a well-known lawyer. He taught himself law by reading law books. Lincoln was, in other words, a self-educated man. In spite of these differences in Kennedy and Lincoln's backgrounds, some interesting similarities between the two men are evident. In fact, many books have been written about the strange coincidences in the lives of these two men. For example, take their political careers. Lincoln began his political career as a U.S. congressman. Similarly, Kennedy also began his political career as a congressman. Lincoln was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1847. Kennedy was elected to the House in 1947. They went to the Congress just 100 years apart. Another interesting coincidence is that each man was elected President of the United States in a year ending with the number six zero. Lincoln was elected President in 1860. And Kennedy was elected in 1960. Furthermore, both men were president during years of civil unrest in the country. Lincoln was president during the American Civil War. During Kennedy's term of office, civil unrest took the form of civil rights demonstrations. Another striking similarity between the two men was that, as you probably know, neither lived to complete his term in office. Lincoln and Kennedy were both assassinated while in office. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas, after only one thousand days in office. Lincoln was assassinated in 1865, a few days after the end of the American Civil War. It's rather curious to note that both presidents were shot while they were sitting next to their wives. These are only a few examples of the uncanny and unusual similarities between the destinies of these two American men, who had a tremendous impact on the social and political life of the United States and the imagination of the American people. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Place where they told you what to chase, told you how to run the race. Every move was on the page, but I didn't like their way. Had to fight and misbehave. Had to find a way to change. Had to leave to find my way. Caught up in a daydream, I be in my mind up there almost daily. It's how I pass time, no opinions safely. It's how I understand what I want in this place. See, 'cause everybody wanna tell you bad things. What could go wrong? What fame brings, but success is a finicky thing. Hello everyone, welcome to Team Alt Stream. I'm RP. You are watching the Alt's Listening Test Channel. I'm super excited to announce that on your demand we have started a series of writing task 1 and writing task 2. And today I'm going to explain how to write effective writing task 1. And this is process. Process you can see. It's a process here like shape, shearing, cleaning, then drawing, spinning and wool. Wool then tufts of wool you can see and then spinning we can see string over here, recycling. and tufts of wool it mean tuft storage and then you can see ball of yarn and then knitting and then carpets and jackets okay the main difference uh, between writing a process or diagram and is that and uh, writing bar graph pie chart table or line graph is that we have to describe each and every detail while writing process each and every detail we don't have to miss any step right so are you ready here we go the diagram detail the process of making wool process of making wool yes fine we don't need to write this one because we have to select and report every detail so no need to write this one 
so diagram detail the process of making wool and this is how i have written introduction the picture shows the procedure by which wool is processed and transformed into a variety of product here you can see it was just how wool is collected shearing cleaning drying and then finally we can see uh, how carpets and jackets are made here you can see uh, going through so many process so many steps after taking so many steps how jackets and carpets are made all right so first of all in uh, i have written introduction that was introduction and this is overview looking from an overall perspective it is readily apparent that processing wool involves initial stage of preparation of raw source material raw source material by like there are sheep or here and this is shearing and then cleaning and drying okay and preparation of the so initial stages of preparation of raw source material then middle stages constituting the production of tufts and the final stage is result, resulting in yarn and finished consumer products here you can see this was first initial stage and we can see shape and then shearing and cleaning and drying the middle stage we can see wool spinning of wool making of tufts of wool and then tuft storage and then we can see string recycling knitting and carpets and jackets here you can see carpets and jackets so this is how i have written main body paragraph 1 the process begins when sheep wool is sheared cleaned and then dried here you can see sheep wool is shearing cleaning and drying means sheared cleaned and dried here you can see sheep wool is sheared cleaned and dried and then subsequent to this the raw product is spun here you can see spinning so raw product is spun and this is third form of spin spin spun spun and then either made into string with some being recycled as by product or turned into wool so here you can see wool and tufts of wool you can see or you can see some string and then recycling so i have written over here uh then either made into string with some being recycled as by product or turning into wool this is how i have written last paragraph main body paragraph 2 the wool is fashioned into tufts of wool tufts of wool you can see over here and then stored tufts of wool and then tuft storage so they are stored then they are collected in the storage and then the last step involves turning the tufts into ball of yarn so here you can see storage of tufts and then balls of yarn and then knitting and then carpet they are made carpets and jackets are made so here i have written the last step involves turning the tufts into ball of yarn which can then be used for knitting or for fabrication of consumer retail items such as jackets and carpets so we can see the last stage over here knitting and then carpets and jackets you can see lots of carpets and jackets are made as a final stage so that was the process how we can mean make wool product by shearing cleaning and drying it in the first stage so this is how you can write process nice effective process so this is the end of the video but don't forget to subscribe our channel like comment and share the video and please press the bell icon so that you can get notification of every new video bye bye see you in my next lesson